In this hour, experience the joy of music, teaching, praise, and encouragement from the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this special presentation of The Morning Worship from First Christian Church in Johnson City, Tennessee, a loving community transforming lives.
Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more. We're hanging on every word. Come and speak to us, oh Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word, Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more, we're hanging on every word, cause when you speak and when you
Well, hello, church. It is super good to be with you. My name is Ethan Magnus. I am one of the pastors here at First Christian. And if you're a guest with us today, man, we are so grateful that you are here today. Hope you've already been made to feel welcome. Uh, you certainly are welcome. Glad you're a part of us. And you're here on a great week. Uh, we're kicking off our new series, Phases. It's just a phase. Don't miss it. I love this series. I'm excited about it. This is one of these series where I just love the title. Uh, you know, because I, I think the title alone, maybe if you kind of toyed with it a little bit, it probably already got your wheels spinning just a little bit. I, I don't know about you, but I'm one of those, I think like most of our culture, who, who has been taught that when you find somebody in a phase, your, your, your kind of first instinct is kind of ignore it, right? If it's just a phase, they'll get over it. If it's just a phase, it'll pass. If it's just a phase, wait a little while, they'll be on to a new phase, so why worry yourself too much about this phase? And I suppose if, if what we mean is, you know, your daughter dyes her hair purple and you realize that's just a phase so you can just wait it out. I suppose that's a good idea. But, but in general, once you realize that life is all phases, it's just one phase after another, after another, after another, if you, if you adopt the strategy of it's just a phase, we'll ignore it, we'll let it pass, well, you're just ignoring life at some point. You're just ignoring everything at some point. And so instead, the challenge we have before us, the opportunity we have, is to say just the opposite. To say it's just a phase. It's so short. Don't miss it. Make the most of every phase and every day, whatever phase. If you missed the last phase, okay, take, take 30 seconds living in regret, and then let's get focused on making sure we don't miss this one. Because it's just a phase. And it happens so fast. Today we're talking about uh, the first phase of life, the phase of childhood, uh, from, from zero through elementary school. We're talking about that phase where we grow so fast and we learn so much, the people around us can hardly keep up with us. We're talking about it because I think most of you have the same instinct I have, that boy, it is hard to be a kid these days. You know, I, I don't know. I suppose maybe every parent looks at their own children and thinks, wow, it's so much harder to be a kid. But I know that's how I feel. I, I look at the, the lives kids lead today, the context in which they're in. Everybody is busier, it feels like, than they used to be. Our economic realities make it harder and harder for parents to have the kind of time and leverage they'd like to to be with their kids. It just feels like it's hard to be a kid. And yet, our desires for our children haven't changed. We want our children to grow up healthy and strong. We want them to feel, fulfill their maximum potential intellectually and socially and spiritually and morally and physically. We, we, we want our kids to, to succeed and grow. By the time they finish elementary school, we want them to be strong enough to handle the rigors of middle school and high school. We want them to be tough enough to make moral decisions on their own. We want them to be independent enough to begin to function ever increasingly on their own because they've got a good head on their shoulders. We want all this stuff for our children. And yet our culture, our context, makes it harder for them to get. And the other thing, this is the one that starts to hit close to home is those things we want for our kids, they cannot get on their own. Now, I know I'm not saying anything very profound when I say it, but have you ever just wrestled with the implications of that? Whatever it is you want for the children in your circle of influence, your own children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, the, the neighbor kids down the street, the kids you see at the mall, whatever it is you want for those kids, they cannot get it on their own. They can't get food on their own or clothing on their own or shelter on their own. They can't get moral guidance on their own. They can't get encouragement and support from loving adults on their own. Kids get what we give them. Nothing more, nothing less. It sort of feels like it raises the stakes a little bit, doesn't it? The, this sermon series, It's Just a Phase, it's based off a book uh, by Reggie Joyner and Kristen Ivey. Uh, Reggie is a, a children's minister guru. He's a great guy, influenced a lot of people for children's ministry. Kristen Ivey is a developmental psychologist. They've partnered together to write this really helpful book to help us think about the phases of life and how every phase is unique. Every phase has unique challenges, but also unique opportunities. They talk about the phase of childhood. Uh, they, they say things like this, that um, research shows that the optimism of a child entering elementary school will, for almost every kid, that will be their outlook for the rest of their life. 
So if they enter elementary school with a sense of hopefulness and strength and support, like they're going to succeed, they'll probably feel that way about middle school and high school and college and their first job and when they become parents, all the way on. And the other thing's true too, if they don't. To, to learn to feel hopeful about the world, if you, if you weren't taught that in childhood, is very, very hard, very, very challenging for a lot of us. They talk about how in childhood, children have core questions they're trying to answer. The children are trying to figure out the answer to the question, am I loved? Do I matter? Do I have value? Is my world safe? Are the rules of my word rel- world reliable? Can I depend on it? This is why kids, whatever they say, they crave discipline. I don't mean cruel discipline. I mean kind discipline. But they crave boundaries and standards because they want to know they live in a reliable world. They, They were saying that for elementary school students, the question that dominates the elementary school years is the question, do I have what it takes? Am I competent and capable? In educational theories, they call it, they say children are trying to achieve mastery. They're trying to understand grammar and understand physics and understand how to tie their shoes. Do I have what it takes, right? This is, you, you see a kid who's always been happy to have their parents tie their shoes for four or five, six years. All of a sudden, one day, I can do it. They're trying to answer this question, do I have what it takes to navigate in the world? The stakes are high. What we want for our kids, they cannot get on their own. What they get in these early years is so developmentally essential to the rest of their lives. You can see why we say it's just a phase. I know childhood won't last forever. Some of you parents with crying babies, you're glad to know it won't last forever. But we also can't miss it. The last thing that makes this so awful is just how short it is. About five years ago, I saw this illustration. I just want to warn you, as a parent, it wrecked me. So I'm going to do it now, but full disclosure, if you're a parent, if you want to get up and go use the bathroom right now and come back in about three minutes, I'll understand. I get it. No judgment here, okay? They're trying to help us get a picture of just how, how, much, what, how much time do you have? Well, what kind of opportunity do you have to give your children what you want them to have? Because remember, they can't get it on their own. They only get what's given to them. What kind of opportunity do you have? So he said, imagine if every week between birth and 18 when you kick them out of the house so you can turn their room into a man cave. Imagine if every year between birth and 18 were represented by a marble. So this one down here at the bottom, that's when you start shopping for your man cave because they're going to leave in three days. And this one way up here at the top, that's when you bring them home from the hospital. Imagine if every week you would have around 930 marbles. That's it. That's a lot of marbles, right? You know, it's a lot of weeks to influence and tell a child that they're loved and safe, to tell a child they have what it takes. That's a lot of marbles. What if, though, your child were in elementary school? Wow. That is a much smaller pile of marbles. That's how many weeks you got left. Some of that last one felt so big. I remember my kids were in elementary school the first time I saw this illustration. And for me, thinking about it as weeks, somehow, I don't know, it didn't work for me. Because I was working during the week, and they were in school during the week. On Sundays, we were all at church, and we loved it, but we were busy, you know, and I would see them as we crossed paths. I started thinking about each of the marbles as Saturdays. That's how many Saturdays I've got left to tell my kids they're loved, to have what it takes. I love them, God loves them. Got that many Saturdays left. I got out my phone right in the middle of the sermon. You could do this too. I emailed somebody. They had just asked me to come speak at something. It was a men's retreat or something. I was really excited about it. I emailed them and Told them I know I'd said yes, but I was going to have to cancel because I didn't have many marbles left. They said they'd heard that about me. They thought it was probably a good choice. (laughs) My kid's in seventh grade right now. My youngest, he's in seventh grade. This is how many marbles I've got left. 
with him. That's how many Saturdays I've got. That's why I spent yesterday with him bouncing on a blob at a lake. Because we're about to run out of marbles. And I told you it was brutal. I apologize for this, but I didn't invent time. I just hold up jars of marbles. If you got a kid who's a senior in high school, that's how many marbles you got left between now and next August. That one right there. That's the one where you help them load their stuff into the back of a 93 Toyota Corolla. <laughs> it's just a phase. Don't miss it. This is why here at this church, we are committed to investing everything we can into the kids and the students that God sends to us. We'll invest in your kids and your students. We'll invest in the kids and students in this town and this county, anybody who shows up on our doors, because we want to make the most. These questions, remember, they can't answer them for themselves. They will believe the answer they are told, so we're going to tell them they're loved and they're safe because they have a Savior. Their world is reliable because their God is faithful. And we're going to tell them they have what it takes every chance we get. I'm so proud of this church. I, I didn't even know this when I started talking to this church. This church has this amazing preschool. I was down touring it last week. It's incredible. Uh, we're, we're just doing that because we know there aren't that many marbles. And so, you know, we're not looking for extra stuff to do. But if we can partner and help a family make the most of their marbles, we're going to do it. So I will say, just a little commercial here, we do have openings. And if you're looking for a way to make the most of your marbles, you should talk to somebody about the preschool if you've got a kid that age. I, I'm, I love our FCC Kids Ministry. We invest like crazy in our FCC Kids Ministry because we want to be the best partners we can be in making the most of your marbles. I hope your kids are connected on Sunday morning and Wednesday nights. I hope you're inviting the neighbor's kids. Maybe you don't have kids, but there are some kids down the street. I promise you their parents would love a free date night. Tell them you'll bring them on Wednesday nights. See if they don't say yes. Just give it a chance, you know. Let's make the most of these marbles we've got. Let's teach the kids. Because remember, if we don't tell them the answer, they won't figure out the answer. Because that's the thing about being a kid. You can't get what you need on your own. You get what's given to you. Nothing more. Nothing less. We're going to dial in real quickly to one of these questions. One of these essential questions. This is the question that these sociologists say dominates the elementary school years. It's the do I have what it takes question. And, and here's the thing you'll discover about this question. First of all, when you start to think about this question, it explains so much of children's behavior that maybe didn't make sense to you. Have you ever seen this? You're at a baseball or a softball game, and the kid uh, is walking up, and right before they step into the batter's box, they stop and kind of look around up in the stands. Or maybe they look back at their coach. And if they look up in the stands, they're looking for mom or dad or cousin or whoever it is who brought them, some adult that cares about them. And they're waiting for that person to say, you can do it! Hit a home run! You got it! Go for it! You'll be great! Right? Or they look back at the coach and the coach says, yeah, you can do it. Come on, swing hard. Because they're asking the question. Before they step into the batter's box, they're asking do I have what it takes? And they're looking for someone to give them the answer. And once you see this, you'll see kids do this all the time, right? I, I just yesterday saw a kid walk up on the top of this platform. They were getting ready to jump into this thing, right? And before they did it, they looked over and they looked around. I was like, come on, the line's got to move here. I'm the jerk saying, I want my turn to jump. Come on, kid. You don't get out of the way. Jump or get out of the way. But as soon as she found mom and mom said, She said, okay. She was just trying to find out if she had what it takes. And mom said she did. So she believed her. And she jumped. This, this lens of understanding the power of this question in an elementary student's life, it helps, it makes so, this is why people, if you're a teacher here, I'm going to tell you a secret. You've probably figured this out already, but I, it dawned on me recently. When a kid says you were their favorite teacher, it isn't because you taught them long division. I just bet's bad news. They, they don't care that much about long division. It's because when you taught them long division, you told them they were smart. You see the difference? What, we, our favorite teachers weren't the ones who taught us information we really needed to know. They were the ones who told us we had what it took, that we could do it, 
that we were smart or brave or strong or fast. Coaches, don't just tell your kids, you won the game. They know they won the game. The scoreboard's right there. Tell them they're great. Tell them they're wonderful. Tell them they're amazing. Tell them they're strong because every kid you meet is asking you the question, do you think I have what it takes? And they want to know the answer. I tell you one thing, though. You all know this. Kids, I'll let you in on a secret. We're all still asking that question. You know what I'm saying? Some of you are asking that question just today. Some of you have a new challenge ahead of you, an unexpected challenge. Maybe you're parenting your grandkids when you didn't think you would be. Or maybe you've got a new job precisely when you wished your old job was still there. Maybe you, you've got a new relationship status and it's not the relationship status you wanted. And you are asking yourself, do I have what it takes? Can I, can I pull this off? And so it turns out the very questions that dominates the life of our kids is a real question for all of us, whatever phase we're in. That's why I'm so glad. I'm just so glad that God wants you to know the answer to this question. I know God wants you to know the answer to this question because Paul, in almost every church he wrote to, he told them the answer to this question. Sometimes they were asking, do we have what it takes to withstand persecution? He would tell them the answer. Sometimes they would say, do we have what it would take to work for unity when it feels like the church is about to fall apart? He would tell them the answer. They would say, do we have what it takes to reach our neighbor for Christ when it feels like we can't accomplish it? He would tell them the answer. Look with me real quickly. Uh, just listen, actually, for a second. I want to read a little bit from 1 Corinthians 12, and then we're going to look at one verse from there. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church, trying to address this fundamental human question, do I have what it takes? He writes this. Now, concerning the gifts of God's Spirit, I do not want you to be uninformed. He says, I want you to know the answer to this question. Because there are different kinds of gifts, but there's one Spirit that distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. He says to everyone, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given a spirit of wisdom, another of knowledge, but all by the same Spirit. To one faith, another healing, but all by one Spirit. To another power, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits to one person is given the gift of speaking languages to another the gift of interpreting those languages but all of these are the work of one and the same spirit and he distributes gifts to everyone just as he determines I love this text. If you're interested, Paul spends all of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 talking about spiritual gifts and how they function in our lives. But for right now, it's enough to just focus on kind of the central verse of Paul's argument, which is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. He says, To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now, we'll get back to this text in just a second, but first of all, we just got to acknowledge that in our world, we have gotten crazy confused on spiritual gifts. You've got some Christians who think it's all about spiritual gifts, and some Christians who don't want to talk about spiritual gifts, and we're also confused, and I think Paul doesn't want us to be confused. I know some people who their approach to spiritual gifts is they've just decided they don't have any spiritual gifts. They're just like, listen, I got nothing really to offer. I come to church, but maybe I used to have some spiritual gifts, but not now. My days of contributing to the body of Christ are over. I, I don't really have anything to offer. They're asking the do I have what it takes question, and they've decided the answer is no. I don't, I don't really have what it takes. Some people at the opposite end, though, right? They're so proud of their spiritual gifts. They wear their spiritual gifts like a Boy Scout wears merit badges, right? They're like, look at me. Look at my spiritual gifts. I got gifts of helps and administration. I can sing like an angel and preach like the devil, you know? I, they just think they're amazing, right? They just think they are so impressive. And the rest of us, you know, are like, I'm not sure you're as, those gifts are as spiritual as you think they are. You know, I think those are more like obnoxious gifts or whatever is the opposite of spiritual gifts. I know some people who they're aware of their gifts and, and they try to be grateful for what they have, but they spend more of their energy being jealous 
of other people's gifts, you know. Did y'all hear that girl play the violin earlier? Y'all hear that? That was, that's something, right? Uh, am I the only person who, like, heard her the first time and was like, oh, shoo, and heard her the second time and was a little bit resentful? Is that, was that just me? Was I the one in the room? I was like, what? She's got to be like one-sixth my age, and she is crushing it. That's amazing, you know? I don't know if that was just me. Apparently it was. Okay, a little confession time here, you know? Uh, but, but that happens to me sometimes. I see gifts that other people have, and I'm like, I wish, why didn't I have that gift? Why, why is that not my gift? And I start to despise the gifts God's given me. Paul wants to protect us from these errors. He wants to do it by dialing into this verse. So check out. Let's pay attention to this verse. And let's check into what it says. Ready? First thing he says is, to each one, gifts has been given. So if you're one of these people who thinks you didn't receive a spiritual gift, well, Paul would beg to differ. He says, everybody has been given gifts from the same spirit. So that protects us from the error of thinking we don't have any gifts to give. The second thing he does is he addresses those of us who are prone to pride. He says, everyone has been given gifts from the Spirit. These gifts are not from you. You didn't generate them. You didn't bring them to the party. God supplies them. So how can you give yourself over to pride for gifts that God has given to you? And then he closes with just the most profound insight of all. He says, to everyone have been given gifts from the same spirit, then he says, for the common good. You need to let that blow your mind just a little bit. Those gifts that you have been given, and you've been given some, because everybody got some, remember? They're from God, so don't get all prideful on me. And they're for somebody else. They're for somebody else. When I remember that, I don't get jealous of that wonderful violin player. Because that gift that God gave her, guess who it's for? It's for me. And you too. It's for you too. Yeah, it's for us. God gave her that gift, but it's for the common good. We get to experience the blessing of that gift, and we don't even have to practice Okay, that is good news to all people, right? Okay, that is the way spiritual gifts are designed to work. God has, say this with me, you ready? So, okay, so, say, I have gifts. gifts. Good, okay. They are, ready? From God. God. Through me. me. For others. others. Say that again. They're from God. They're through me. They're for others. That is how spiritual gifts work. So if you tell me you think you've got a spiritual gift, but you're not sharing it, that is not a spiritual gift. Because gifts that you keep... Well, wait. Before I finish that sentence. I've been teaching this principle a long time uh, to elementary school students and junior high students. And so I've developed a little illustration. And uh, since I developed it for elementary school students, you might be able to understand it. So we'll give it a shot here, okay? All right, so imagine that um, Billy is having a birthday party, okay? Billy's having a birthday party, and, and Johnny arrives for the birthday party, and uh, Johnny runs up to the house here, and he knocks on the door, and Billy opens the door, and Billy says, stop that, Billy says, Johnny, I'm so glad you're here. Did you bring gifts? Okay, Billy is not a very tactful young man, but okay, that's what he says. And Johnny says, did I bring gifts? These shoes were a gift from my grandparents. This jacket was a gift from my parents. And this watch, I gave this to myself because I just thought I needed a little me time. Get it? It's a watch. Me time. Okay, so he says, I brought gifts. And he walks on into the house and Billy is just like, look in there. And he's like, Yes, so so that's not what I meant, you know, when I said, okay, just about that time, Susie comes up to the door. Susie comes up, she knocks on the door, Billy opens the door, Billy, again, not a very tactful young man, he says, hey, Susie, I'm so glad you're here, did you bring gifts? Susie says, (gasps) and she turns, 
and she runs back to the car where her mother is still parked in the driveway because Susie is not prepared for the party. She does not have what it takes. She runs back to the car. As she approaches the car, the window rolls down and out pops a hand carrying a bag with all that stuffy paper sticking out of the top. And Susie grabs the bag and she says, Thanks, Mom. She takes a couple steps. She calls back, What is it? And her mom says, It's Legos. She says, Okay. And then she starts running across the lawn. Now remember this moment. I'm going to finish the story, but you remember this moment right here. Susie holding the bag. Mom parked there. Billy right here. Susie runs over. She says, Yes! I brought gifts. She hands the gift to Billy and goes on in. Ten minutes later, Billy takes the stuffy paper out, pulls out the Legos, and he says, Yes! I love Legos! This moment, right here, where Susie's halfway across the lawn between the car and the door, that is what it means to have a spiritual gift. It is not from you, Susie didn't go to Target and find those Legos. Her mom did that. It is not for you, it's for Billy. In fact, it was chosen especially for Billy. She picked it out for Billy. She just gets to be the one that carries it. And that is a great joy because Susie's the one who gets to sit in the room when Billy opens it and it was so happy and Susie's happy and Billy's happy and everybody's happy except for Billy's mom who's going to be stepping on those Legos for the next six months. But everybody else, everybody else is overjoyed. That's the way spiritual gifts work. You see, Jason, or was it Johnny? Anyways, the first kid who showed up, he got confused. Because gifts that you keep, that's just stuff that you have. If you get a gift and you don't give it, it is no longer a gift. It's just stuff. To everyone, gifts have been given for the common good. Some days... Some days, I know, life feels like you have showed up to the wrong party and you ask yourself, do I have what it takes? Because I don't feel like I have what it takes. I'm pretty sure I am unprepared. I didn't bring the right present for this party. I didn't even know it was a birthday party. That's okay. Because your Heavenly Father went to Target. He's got it covered. Okay? Our God is the one who gives us the gifts he intends us to give. All we do is carry it across the lawn and give it to the person God gave it to us for. You have what it takes, not because you are prepared, but because your God is prepared. I had somebody... Last week, we were talking about being a witness to those people who are far from God, and it was, it was a challenging word. It was hard for me. And somebody came up to me, and they said to me, they said, Ethan, I, I really, I, I, you're probably right that I really should do that. I just don't know. Do you think I can do it? I, I wanted to say to him, are you trying to write my sermon for next week for me? Because I mean, was, the answer is obvious. No, she can't do it. She doesn't have what it takes, but God does, and he'll give it to her every single time she needs it. God is incredible that way. So here's your homework. You ready? First of all, I need you to immerse yourself in this truth. If you're at a moment where you're struggling with wondering if you've got what it takes, revel in this truth. Just say, I have gifts from God through me for others. I do. I claim it in the name of Jesus Christ. I have gifts from God through me for others. And as soon as you've got it, tell some kid you know. Because every kid you know is asking the question, do I have what it takes? Every kid you know is asking that question. The next time you see some kid running in church, tell them they're fast. Don't tell them they're too fast. That's the opposite. Tell them they're fast. Tell them maybe they could be a runner someday. 
The next time you see some kid laughing and cutting up in church, tell them they're funny. Maybe they could be a comedian. The next time you see, see some kid, you know, counting the lights in the ceiling instead of paying attention to the sermon, tell them they'd be a great accountant someday. The next time you see some kid talking too loud, tell them they could be a preacher. I don't know. Just tell them. Tell them that they have what it takes because they want to know the answer. And you now know God's answer to the question. And if you don't tell them, nobody else will. Tell them they have gifts that are from God that he wants to give through them and they're for somebody else and you don't even know who they're for yet and you can't wait to help them find out who those gifts are for. I want to get real specific here. I just want to know, I talked about our children's ministry here, FCC Kids. FCC Kids is amazing. We believe God is preparing us to reach more children than we currently reach today. To do that, we need more people who are ready to say, I will be one of the ones who helps our children answer these questions. I would just like to invite you. We've got these cards in the back of the seats in front of you. If, maybe that's you. Maybe sometimes you're like, okay, I want to make sure every kid in this church knows the answer to this question, and I'm going to help tell them. If that's you, I would just challenge some of you. I really think some of you probably need to fill this card out, and on the way out, you're going to see people wearing these classy T-shirts just like me. Give them one of these cards. They're going to call you. You're not signing your life away. You're just saying, I'd be willing to have a conversation about how I could help answer some of these life-changing questions for the children in our church. But for all of us, now none of that, this isn't for everybody. It's for a lot of you, but it's not for everybody. But if what's for everybody, I bet almost every one of us is going to bump into a kid sometime in the next couple of weeks. Every kid you bump into has this question on their mind. Just tell them the answer. Just tell them they're awesome for no good reason. Tell them they're smart. Tell them they're funny. Tell them they're clever. Tell them they're creative. Tell them they have what it takes. If you've got time for three sentences, tell them God wants to give you special gifts through you for other people. Three sentences. You can do that. Tell them the story of the birthday party if you've got enough time. We're going to be the church that recognizes that we have what it takes because our God supplies our needs and that every child we run into has what it takes because our God will supply their needs too. Let's pray. God, it's hard to believe sometimes. We are fragile and scared. We're nervous and overwhelmed. We face situations where we're just sure we don't have what it takes. And on our own, God, we don't. But you, God, are an ever-faithful God. You have supplied our needs. And so, God, I just pray for this church, for everyone here still struggling, struggling to receive that word, that they would just hear again from the Apostle Paul to everyone, to everyone, from God's Spirit, for other people, gifts are given. Let us believe that truth, God. And then, believing that truth, help us to teach that to every child who crosses our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right now, I invite you to stand as we sing together our commitment to be those who use what God has given us for other people, and especially our children. Let's sing together. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath I take, every moment I wait, Lord, have your way in me, Lord, I give you my heart. Oh
our new message series, It's Just a Phase, we are celebrating the different phases of life, their uniqueness, and their God-given opportunities that they each represent. Maybe you can't really remember the first time you rolled over or walked, but maybe you do remember studying for your first test or getting your driver's license. Maybe you've experienced your first job interview or maybe your first job loss. For me, having permission from Mrs. Carter to write in cursive when I moved from second to third grade was a pretty big moment. Or finally being able to drive myself home from school rather than taking the bus home. From rolling over to crawling, from walking to wheeling, our experience of life moves through phases that can be all at once exciting, challenging, joyous, grief-laden, and life-filled, and at times even cyclical. While we once needed a babysitter, we may now be the babysitter. While once we babysat, we may now need a caregiver. We may perceive that our life is progressing, cycling, regressing, or even stalling. Perhaps we feel we have few phases left to experience. Perhaps we feel we want to move to the next phase of life. According to the writer of Ecclesiastes, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. We can have a tendency as humans to look toward the past or toward the future and miss the present moment. Each phase carries with it unique joys and unique sorrows. Each phase is perhaps bittersweet, but each phase is to be lived and lived for God. What wonderful news, though, that in every phase, what we need most is a Savior, and that is what Christ Jesus offers. Child, teen, young adult, or not so young adult, we are all loved by a glorious God who sent his only Son to die so that we might live. No age minimum or maximum bars us from the love of God. And now we gather around the communion table to remember and proclaim that Christ has died for us so that we could experience freedom from sin and guilt and experience the gift of eternal life. Matthew chapter 26, 26 through 28 reads, while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Remind us of these wonderful texts that we learned, most of us, when we were kids, in that kid phrase, phase. Let's just sing these words together as we prepare to take the communion. Jesus loves me.
Please join me in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, as we gather around this table, we remember the sacrifice you made. When we remember the sacrifice, we know you love us. And we know you love us so much that you died for us. But that's not all we remember. We also remember that you rose from the dead to give us new life. And as we take this bread and cup, we remember your death, your resurrection, and your amazing love. It's in Christ's strong name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this presentation of Worship at First Christian Church in Johnson City, Tennessee. We're grateful for this opportunity to minister to you by way of television, and you're invited to be with us in person at any time. Our worship times and much more information about First Christian can be found on our website, www.fcc-jc.org, or you can call us at 423-232-5700. The church is located at 200 East Mount Castle Drive in Johnson City, Tennessee. This has been a production of First Christian Church Television Ministries.